So if you've got time, you're welcome to be here. And we have a very special guest, Mr. Blaine Andrews. Some of you who know Blaine and others, if you have not met him, you're about to, to meet him and be dazzled and delighted by stories and all kinds of wonderful okay. information and Don't insight. Too thick. Yeah. <laughs> insight into the world of uh, essential oils. Uh, he's been a herbalist, phytotherapist into the world of aroma what? Aroma what? Well, uh, that's, that's just it. A lot of people know me for working with essential oils. I've been working with, they kind of took over my career about 35 years ago. And um, I was already working as a herbalist and I learned a bit about essential oils in herbal college, but I didn't kind of get the drift. And then I re-met them and they kind of took over my life. And I hate the word aromatherapy. I think it's a goofy word. Aromatherapy, in its truest sense, means that aroma itself has therapeutic value, and it does, and it can, and that's part of what I teach. But there's a whole lot of things that I do with essential oils that have nothing to do with aroma. If I'm putting, if you've got a toenail infection and I put lemongrass and tea tree oil, that's allopathic medicine, the same as a doctor would use. Technically, we should call that pharmacognosy, which is a word you might not have heard before, but it's kind of the organic version of pharmacy. Pharmacognosy. You can look it up, Google it when you get home, whatever. I don't care. But um, a lot of what I do as a practicing herbalist, well, I'm retired now, but as a practicing herbalist, I prefer the word phytotherapy. And it doesn't mean I work on dogs. A lot of people hear that and think I'm a veterinarian of some sort. It's not about dogs. I, phytotherapy might be some sort of veterinarian, but P-H-Y-T-O just is Latin for plant. So as a phytotherapist, I can work with living herbs, dried herbs, a cup of tea, flower essences, homeopathy, but I chose to specialize in working with essential oils, right? So I would rather be known as a phytotherapist because a lot, if I'm treating an acute pneumonia or bronchitis, I don't believe that's aromatherapy. If I'm treating PMS, perhaps, that's aromatherapy. So aromatherapy, and it's well documented now that you can be doing effectual treatment below the threshold of smell. So I've had people, for example, treat their wife's PMS without the wife even know she was being treated. Kind of sneaky, kind of creepy in a way, but this guy was hiding one of my blends in the hall closet, and he'd get up really early every morning before his wife did, and tiptoe down the hallway going, about five drops down the hallway, and then about 15 minutes later, his, his wife gets up with bare feet, pads her way down to the bathroom to brush her teeth and all that business, and she's getting, you can't smell it in the hallway, but two months later, he's got a whole new wife. <laughs> Like that's aromatherapy. But essential oils, which are very, very tiny, do a lot of, a lot of influencing all of your endocrine glands. So if we're working on things like headache, stress, just for simple things, and you all know how many disorders and diseases we have now that are simply stress-based, right? So that's aromatherapy. But a lot of what I do with essential oils is more on the physical plane. It's, I work more like a pharmacist would. And over the years, I've had the pleasure of uh, teaching at massage therapy schools, right? Occasionally, I've been called by medical boards to come in and do presentations at hospitals. So I'm not one of these guys that thinks natural therapies are the only way to go. You know, just, just not long ago, I left my home unconscious in an EMS vehicle. I'd had a massive stroke, I'm sorry, a massive seizure, which triggered a stroke. And if a neighbor hadn't just happened to drop by to see what I was doing that afternoon, I would, I would have died that day. I have no memory of any of this. I was in the hospital for several months and my home is now sold. It's gone. A big part of my life, my home that I lived in for 35 years was gone. So I'm starting over. In fact, I used to see eight to 10 audiences a week. And right now you're the first live audience I've, I've been in front of for, well, how many months? No, two and a half years, right? It's a long time. I've been out of work, right? So it gave me time to 
my new future apparently is going to be to do a lot more writing than I used to because now I have time to sit in my room in a care home and do a lot of writing and get a lot of my thoughts out on paper and work on my computer, right? So there's aromatherapy and there's phytotherapy. And something that really frustrates me is just out, out in public is I hear people confusing. In one breath, they're talking about could be almond oil or hazelnut oil or whatever, and something like uh, lavender oil or frankincense or whatever, all in one breath. And those, those different commodities are completely different substances. There's nothing fatty about essential oils. If I take a clean piece of paper, uh, quite often I've done this, we don't have time to do it today, but take a clean piece of computer paper, whatever, and put a couple drops of lavender on it and hang it up near a warm light bulb. By the end of the class, there's nothing to see or smell. The oil has completely left. And a lot of authors will say, that's how you test an oil to make sure that it's pure, that it hasn't been diluted with some sort of fatty oil. But that's, I just want to make it clear that if the oil has any color, like orange oil is going to leave an orange stain on the paper. If you do that with something rosinous like patchouli, there's going to be a brown stain there for 300 years, right? And it would still have some smell after all that time. So you, you kind of have to look at this in a number of different ways. So um, something like almond oil is already rather a cocktail of different fatty acids, right? Nothing you use at home, like olive oil isn't a thing. It's already a mixture of a bunch of different fatty acids. It's already a blend. They're pretty big molecules. Some of the fatty acid blends that we use for face care, for example, for facial care, again, things like evening primrose and whatnot are nice for facial care because they're much shorter carbon chains and they can actually penetrate your skin a little bit. Right, olive oil won't. You can smear it all over your face. <laughs> It'll keep your skin a little bit moist, but it's really an oily mess on your skin. Yeah, it's not going to absorb. You got to pat it off later. Right, they're big, long carbon chains. You're all here because you have some interest in all of the wonderful things that happen at the light cellar. You've got something in common. Carbons like hanging out with other carbons. We live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It's been lots of fun for me to teach all over North America. And it's kind of fun when I've, I've done rooms full of like 4,000 people, international audiences. And it's really fun to come on and say, hi, I'm Glenn Andrew Sick and I'm from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I'm in the oil business. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there with 45 gallon drums, man, but I'm working with little vials like this. And in some cases, like some of our oils are like four bucks a drop. Right, that's just incredible. But nobody's out to rip you off there. Any of the oils that are expensive are because they're either hard to find or hard to grow, or the plant just doesn't have much to give. So if you're feeling a little bit stressed and you've got some Melissa or lemon balm growing out in your yard, you can just walk up to the bush and say, I need your help, honey. And just go like this and rub the leaves a bit and there'll be a cloud of vapor. Blood pressure just dropped 20 points. All right, but it doesn't, it's hard to capture that essential oil. So Melissa is quite, excuse me, quite expensive to buy, right? It just doesn't have that much to give. You can grow it and it's cheap, it's almost free to do that. You can buy a plant at probably any bedding store in the spring, but um, it doesn't have that much to get or it's hard to capture because it's so volatile. That's a nice cider salt oil. Yes, absolutely, and again, Good for skincare, but great for relaxation. Yeah. So that's one of my peeves is hearing people mix those all together. So we have fatty acids that combine to make what you think of cooking oils and that sort of thing. All right. And then we have essential oils. And the big difference is their size. Fatty acids are big, heavy carbon chains. We live in a in a town with hydrocarbons make most of our economy. So three carbons holding hands, for example, in a triangular shape is the basis of propane. A carbon holding hands, it's got four extra hands to hold. It's CH4 is a cow fart. That's methane, okay? Octane is what we put in our vehicles. That's eight carbons holding hands. Now in the plant world, 
there's a little thing called isoprene units. It's five carbons holding hands with an appropriate, now each one of them has a couple extra hands to hold. So I'm a carbon, I'm holding hands with two other carbons and I got two extra free hands to grab a couple of hydrogens with. Hydrogens are really easy to pick up for a date because there's they're one, they're, they're just, I'm just number one and I'm so lonely. And so you can always, you can get a hydrogen anywhere, inside your body, outside the body, on a street corner, you can pick up hydrogen anywhere. So when people talk about organic chemistry, it's known as carbon chemistry because everything in organic chemistry is a carbon backbone, all right? So one of the things that plants do is they make these little five packs, they're kind of like Lego, they're called isoprene units. So we have a five pack of carbons with an appropriate number of hydrogens. And if two of them hold hands, we've got 10 carbons now, it's a monoterpene. If three of them hold cans, there's 15 carbons, it's a sesquiterpene. And a lot of people had never heard that word before a few years ago when CBD oils started showing up all over the street and everybody's running around with chatting about sesquiterpenes and they have no idea what they're talking about. That's what it is. It's a carbon chain and it can be either one long chain or you can make cyclic shapes too. So then it's called cyclic or allocyclic or long chains are called aliphatic. So it's a sesquiterpene. If you have four isoprene units holding hands, just like Lego, you have four of them holding hands. So now it's called a diterpene. We can have triterpenes, 30 carbons, quatraterpenes, 40 carbons. But by the time they get into the 30s, they're too fat to fly. They just, they're too heavy. They can't fly. So when you use a still and you bring water to the boiling point with the herbs in it, all of these little special tissues are exploding and flying with the steam. Ooh, we can fly, we can fly. Wahoo, we can get out of these silly leaves. But when they come out the other end, they go, oh no, but we can't swim. They never taught us to swim. So distilled water will hold three to five parts per thousand. Nice spring water from the mountains won't because it's full of minerals. Tap water won't because it's full of crap, right? But distilled water can hold three to five parts per thousand. So when you distill roses, for example, if we could put 60,000 roses in that thing, we would end up with one ounce of rose oil. That's why some of the rose oils are up to over a thousand dollars my cost at wholesale prices from uh, different countries all over the world. Bulgaria is one of the world leaders, right? So we get a whole big pail full of what's called a hydrosol. And Malcolm makes a lot of those right here at the light cellar, right? So you get a whole lot of hydrosol, but as soon as that water is saturated in that three to 5% range, the rest of the oils dissociate, just like when you cook a chicken, you throw a chicken, you throw a chicken. Have you got anything open that we can just pass around like a something or other, the spruce or the fur? Just, yeah, no, let's, just, let's just pass the hydrosol in. Okay, I will do. And I just want to show it here, like you're saying. So this is a rosemary hydrosol and you can see that oil skim on the top. So it takes some pretty special lab equipment to separate that. You don't want to just lick it off, right? But a whole bunch of herb went into making that, that gallon jar. I got a suggestion in pounds. Now how many loose? How much, how much is in there? How much herb? Oh, uh, we put in about five pounds. Okay, and that's probably the max for that still, hey? It was filled, yeah. Right, it filled this five pounds. So you can see how little essential oil we got out of all that much herb. I love, did you say rosemary? I love rosemary and something that a lot of people like, who did that song about when I think back to all of the crap I learned in high school, whose song was that? Simon and Garfunkel. Simon Garfunkel? Okay, so it's amazing that we can remember anything at all. And something, I got a nice compliment one day, I was doing a talk at a teacher's convention about the medicinal herbs of things you already own that are in your kitchen cupboard. And I had a standing room only crowd. We went late into this, the lunch hour and a, a nice man came up to give me, he said, excuse me, but you just made me realize I'm a really lousy teacher. And I said, how's that? 
And he said, well, what do you want? To, oh, well, okay, yeah, just take the lid, pass it around. You could have warned me. I did not see that coming. But guess what? Because I'm actually, I'm glad you did that. Um, we can take, I had the first time I did this was with one of my students' mothers. And she had a really bad case of shingles. And you do little things like you just don't realize that you've been scratching at your shingles and then happen to rub her eye. And she moved the virus into her eye. So now she's got shingles in her eye sockets. I can't imagine the pain of that. Actually, do I have that here? I think I do. Let me just find something here for you quickly. It won't take long. I'm on the right way. I'm trying to find that. I think that this is the ugliest photograph in the world. So shingles is one of the herpes strains. Show it online and we can pass it around. So what you're looking at there is one skin cell. And it had a little blue dot hiding inside of it. So anybody, did anybody here not have chicken pox? Yeah? Okay, you're rare. So almost everybody had chicken pox. And for those of us who did, you still do. And it's hiding in cells of your body. And usually it could be around my age. You get real stressed about something. It's very often, especially for women, something wrong with the kids or the loss of your spouse or somebody died close to you, you know. And all of a sudden you're real stressed emotionally. And that one of those little blue dots says, I can come out to play. So once it makes that decision, it starts, it's like multi-level marketing. It starts, it just starts cloning itself until there's so many little blue dots that this whole skin cell just explodes. So when you get a cold sore, this is what's happening on your face. And if you go like this, you've got millions, millions of viruses on your skin. So if I did that and, and just took my arm and rubbed it on some good solid skin, nothing would happen to me. But if you have a little nick, any sort of a scratch, and sometimes it's called kissing disease that we pass things like that, one set of lips or the other for women, you know, and, and this is how it's passed because around your lips, you have tiny little micro cracks, very thin skin, and that's how it gets into your body. So whether it's cold sores or chicken pox or shingles, it's, that's what you're looking at inside, right? Thanks, Ron. So I'm glad I brought that. So um, going over the centuries, we, oh, I don't want to get off that other story, sorry. Um, here's this woman with shingles in her eye socket and she's in so much pain, she was ready to poke her eyes out with a stick. You know, and her doctor had nothing for her. They didn't seem to have anything in modern medicine to deal with that. Uh, but I took a cold sore blend that I've made for years and microdosed it. So essential oils are soluble in distilled water at three to five parts per thousand. So you do a little bit of math. Oh, and this is a, here's a sidebar. I'll come back. Honest, I will. <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm kind of famous for sidebarring and tearing off on segues to, to the point of pain sometimes. I, I often look at a class and say, well, has everybody gone fishing at least once? You go like this and then you reel the fish in, right? So if you realize I'm so far off on a tangent, just start doing that and that'll, that'll tell me to reel it in a little bit, right? So um, you do a little math and usually what it looks like is if you take perhaps a two ounce little spray bottle and put a couple of drops uh, so it's full of distilled water only and put a couple of drops of the essential oil blend in and shake the crap out of it. You can spray that right into your eyes. So in 48 hours, we had her fixed for a total cost of $6. Amazing. That's not aromatherapy. That's phytotherapy. Back to my point, right? Treating pneumonia. Yes. There's a lot of, a lot of oils that are antiviral. One of the oldest ones uh, that comes up, um, you may be with me on this or not, but 
I know when I was a child, we thought the Egypts were ancient. Now we know they're modern. Like we're just finding so many more things. So to me, the Bible is a recent collection of short stories. That's actually a pretty modern book. It's only 2000 years old, you know, and how long have we been around, you know, maybe too long, <laughs> you know, at any rate. Um, so I think the blend that I make is, well, here's another tip about blending. When you get a recipe from somebody, if it's written down in this order, or you've made one yourself, you made it before and you're making it again, you, you've just blended something. It was just beautiful for a friend, for a birthday gift. If you made it in this order, make it in that order again, because every time you add one oil to another oil, you're interrupting some dancing. Geranium has something like 256 components in it. So what happens if you add a drop of geranium to some lavender oil? Who knows? It's like some sort of mosh pit going on. Like it's, it's, a, it's a major dance going on. So it's, if, you, if you do the same blend in this order, you may end up with a completely different blend. You get where I'm going there? Because, you know, am I going to grab hands with you first and then grab hands with her and we're going to spin around twice and then I'm going to grab, and then you're going to grab, oh, you're not in yet. She's going to grab you and pretty soon we get the whole room line dancing or something. But it depends on, it's very random. Okay, so, and always it's like cooking. If you've got friends coming for dinner tonight and you're a stressed out mess, you're really cranky because somebody ran over your cat, whatever, you're sad and cranky at the same time, stay out of the kitchen. Because all of that energy that you're carrying is going into the food. I feel very strongly about that. So anybody that's ever come to, to help me, I call them the elves. Uh, most of my elves have been past students that want to keep picking my brain. So they'll come and work for me for almost no money, but I insist on paying them anyway. So um, back to that blend, we've got, I'm just trying to remember. Um, I think I can pull it out of my hand. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, eucalyptus are one of its sisters. There's several different kinds of melaleuca. All right. Some of the families, it's, it's really quite amazing. Like eucalyptus, which is a cousin to melaleuca. There's 700 kinds of eucalyptus. Wow. I, I have five of them in my oil collection. There's hundreds that are used for lumber and a whole lot of them are probably used for firewood. And a lot of them are just used for koala food, <laughs> right? You know, there's, but there's that many kinds and the chemistry of them really varies a lot. The same happens with all of the plants in the mint family, like rosemary, like lavender, like hyssop is where I was going. So hyssop is well, it's mentioned several times in the Bible at a time in history where disease was because somebody annoyed the witch who lives uh, up, up at the end of town there. She's helped lots of us in the past, but right now she's cranky. So she put a spell on the village and that's why we're all sick. That's what disease was, right? We had a lot of things we didn't understand. I had, um, oh, I don't need a show of hands. Anybody ever use a product such as this? Dr. Lister changed the world. When he, when he started his career as a surgeon, surgical quarters, any sort of OR was disgusting. If I was a surgeon, an early surgeon back then around the say 1900, um, I'd have my last patient's blood dried on my schmock some of the scalpels and things weren't even cleaned. If they were cleaned with anything, they might have used vinegar, which is acetic acid, right? So we owe it to Dr. Lister, who started studying why sepsis occurred. More than half of people that had surgery done on them died. That was the survival rate back then, 50% if you're lucky. People died because they were working in such unsanitary conditions, all right? So he started thinking, and he started specializing in oral surgery, some of it experimental, right? And a lot of his, even more of his patients died because our mouths are so filthy, right? So he started thinking, looking around, and he, he took a, a compound called carbolic acid that's used back then. They were using it to keep sewage less stinky. And he started playing with carbolic acid and, and cleaning his tools with it. And his success rate went up. 
but he thought this stuff's way too powerful. It'll burn your skin. And he's, how many of you have ever bought, you're into oils a bit, a diffuser? Next time you use it, thank Dr. Lister because he made the first diffuser around 1900, right? He lived to 85, which is a pretty good age for that time period. I'm not sure if they ever met, but he, he was running hand in hand with some of the work that Louis Pasteur was doing at that time. They were about the same age. And germ theory, as it's called in modern medicine today, uh, came from one or the other. I tend to think from all the, the reading I've done that it actually came from Dr. Lister first, but we typically attribute germ theory to Louis Pasteur, right? So this guy trying to sanitize surgical rooms started using carbolic acid in a diffuser, but it's really hard on the skin. He kind of imagined, we used to think so many people get sick when there's a bad smell in the air. Bad smells, dark, funky swamps and things are called miasmas. You just have these smelly things. So think about in one part of the world where we had a real strong miasma and people were getting sick and dying. So we have bad is often like malpractice, mal, mal, air, e, a, which still is one of the biggest killers in the world, right? So we went through all of this time to get where we are today, just understanding some of these things. So Dr. Lister took the carbolic acid. There's another one called carboxylic acid. It's a little bit different. It's got an extra oxygen in there, but uh, carbolic acid was used to treat sewage and he started using it medically. And then he realized that this was just too harsh on the skin. He was using the diffusers in the surgical suites with open heart surgery going on. And some of the doctors were getting coughs because it's quite harsh. Their skin was burning if they were in there too long. So he had to find something better to use. So he had turned to some of the plants that he knew some of his herbal friends were using. And if you read the label on this bottle, under medicinal ingredients, the first, not the last, the first three ingredients are, um, sorry for blanking. Um, it, it's uh, from eucalypt eucalyptol, sorry. Eucalyptol, thymol from red thyme, all right, and menthol from peppermint. So we have a lot of products on the market that are taken orally, like Pepto Bismol. What's the active ingredient in Pepto Bismol? Peppermint oil. And then there's a bunch of latex because it soothes, it soothes the irritation and chalk, which it, it makes sense because it's kind of like activated charcoal. So Pepto Bismol. If you take a little sip, you're getting a couple drops of peppermint oil. And why would we ever be afraid to take some peppermint? Like but but Blaine, I... essential oils are toxic. You're not supposed to take them internally. <laughs> Isn't that the narrative? Thank you, Sidebar. <laughs> um, okay. Now, the best peppermint, we had somebody making peppermint in Southern Alberta for a while. And it was actually, I supported them. I was carrying it for my clients, but compared to what I get from Oregon, it was horrible because <laughs> the climate's a little different. And most of the best peppermint and spearmint that's grown in North America comes from the Oregon, Washington area, right? Like Yakima, that whole area, you got all these rolling valleys and sea air coming in and all that sort of thing. And um, so this is the same peppermint that's in Wrigley's gum. I've met the actual distillers that make this oil, right? The biggest thrill of my career has been on a few occasions speaking in front of international audiences at a big conference in San Francisco. And they have uh, committees there that'll be in front of a crowd, just the actual distillers and you get to meet them afterwards and stuff. And this was very, very important to me because sometimes what people say when they're at a podium being recorded might be one thing, but if you're sitting beside them at the dinner that night, that's only for the presenters, and after a nice dinner and four bottles of wine, what they might admit is something completely different. You know, that last book I wrote there, chapters four and five, man, what a bunch of hoo-la that was. Okay. So I learned some of my best information from dinner parties. So what I want you to do, doesn't matter if you get more than one, just get one drop of mint 
if there's more, it can go on the floor and just rub your gums. Just do that. And then close your mouth, take a deep inhalation through your nose. And there's those little holes in the top of your mouth called the nasal palate and canals, right? And you get that? Yeah. <laughs> it's probably the furthest anybody's ever blown you a kiss, right? So I'm just going to give that to you. And I want everybody in the room to just do that. Now, after you've done that with your finger, don't rub your eye. <laughs> or stick your finger up any other orifice. Don't pick your nose, or if you go to the bathroom, just don't stick that anywhere because mucous membranes are very sensitive. <laughs> Essential oils are all what's called lipolytic, which means they love, 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 love fats. So you can mix them with anything fatty. So if you like working with oils, like in this little first aid kit, You should always have a little vial. If you carry oils around in the dashboard of your car or anything like that, you should always have just a tiny little vial of whatever's in your kitchen. I don't care if it's grapeseed oil or canola oil or olive oil, whatever you use at home. Because if you ever have something go bad, or let's just say you like making relish and things like that. So in fall, you go buy a bunch of peppers at the farmer's market and you're chopping peppers for several hours and it's a hot August night and you got some music on to keep it going and you're in front of a hot stove and you're not thinking because you're sweating and you rub your eye, you know, oh, and you know, I remember, oh, I wish I knew this when I was younger. Remember when I, I made the mistake of picking up a jalapeno pepper and going, what's this? <laughs> and biting into a jalapeno. So in hot peppers, all of the heat is in the seeds. So if you have a recipe that calls for four jalapenos and you know that some of your dinner company tonight are wimps, then still use four jalapenos, but scoop all the seeds out first. And most of the flavor will be there, but without the heat. You get my drift? Yeah. So you should always have some oil around. And if you ever do that and get, right now, peppermint in your eye, um, uh, it's, if you try flushing it with water, it's gonna make it worse. If you get shampoo in your eye, <coughs> flushing it with water makes sense because shampoo is water soluble. All right, but we've already established that essential oils are hydrophobic. They're afraid of water. So if you flush your eye with water, when you get a hot pepper in there, it's going to make it worse because the oil's going to get into the mucous membranes and keep swimming, get deep into the tissues. All you need to do, take if you're on your own, take maybe the round end of a teaspoon, get it into your olive oil or whatever you've got, and let one or two drops of oil. I was just coming back from one of my trips where I had a group of about 16 women up in the mountains for a few days, learning all about how to eat and make medicine with wild plants. So we call this hurdle pharmacy. And I was just coming home and unpacking all of the gear from about a three or four day trip. And I put one box on top of another box, unloading my sequoia. And somehow the safety clip on a, on a bear spray had come out. And I had a full in the face from a foot away right in the face, bear shot, bear spray, right in the face. And I know why bears don't like that stuff. <laughs> okay. And, and it's just, it's very fortunate that my now ex-wife was just coming by walking her dog and found me sort of screaming, laying on the pavement behind my truck and said, honey, what happened? And I said, just go in and get the olive oil. And she said, where, where do you want to put it? Just pour it on my face. <laughs> so she just poured it on my face. Then you go in and get out some soap and water and clean up your face or whatever, right? But all you need is a couple of drops of any time ever with any oil. Uh, linalol is a very important component of things like lavender and geranium. It's, it's a powerful healer and it's, it's antibiotic, all right? But one in about 10,000 people are allergic to it. My brother married one. So we share love. She respects everything that I do, but she can't use a lot of my products because she's allergic to one component that's in a lot of essential oils, right? She's just one of those 10,000 people. So we find other ways to help her with things. It's all good. So allergies do exist, right? Now, where was I? Um, oh yeah, back to the oils in the eye for the lady with um, shingles in her eye socket. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not doing bad for a guy that just had a stroke, but occasionally short-term memory just eludes me. I can still remember words like 
Melaleuca quinquinervia viridiflora, which is a particular type of tea tree, but sometimes short-term memory goes. Anyway, um, so tea tree or one of its sisters, sometimes I use the three I work with the most, the Melaleucas, is the other one's called Kajaput. It's just, it's sort of a slightly milder little cousin. And, and then there's another one called MQV. That's the Melaleuca quinca nervia viridiflora that I just mentioned. So most books just call it MQV because we use the, the acronym because it's a lot easier to yeah, get eight drops of So um, equal parts, um, tea tree or equivalent. Another, another plant that mostly comes from Madagascar that's same tree family and a little more gentle. It kind of makes tea tree seem like cheap brandy and this stuff's more like good aged cognac. It's called Ravensara. We get it mostly from Madagascar. It's a lot more gentle and a lot safer to use and I prefer to use Ravensara. But I think in that blend, um, just to keep costs down so I can have a little vial that anybody can buy for their cold source for cheap. Uh, we have Ravensara, or, or sorry, um, tea tree, Geranium for sure, and geranium is probably the last ingredient. Um, bergamot, I think. You know, I am missing it. There's four oils. Anyway, um, it's it's just a very affordable little blend. And if that fails anybody, I always tell somebody if I'm giving it to a client, if this doesn't work, this is where we start because it's a cheap blend, and it works for most people. If it doesn't work come back and we'll set you up with some Ravensar or some hyssop I was talking about. There's a lovely oil, it's very expensive, called helichrysum. That's a really, really, really incredible oil. You can put it directly on just about any sort of wound or whatever. A um, little bit pricey, why? Because the plant has little to give. It's just one of those ones like, how common is chamomile? You can buy chamomile tea for nothing at Safeway if you want to, right? But the herb doesn't have a lot of essential oil in it. So when you distill chamomile, it's very expensive. Kind of like the Melissa story, the plant likes roses. It just doesn't have much to give. Did you find it? I found it. Okay, cold sore blend, geranium, bergamot, eucalyptus radiata, and tea tree. Okay, and I would blend that in exactly the opposite order with tea tree first and geranium. Eucalyptus. Yeah, and then bergamot and then geranium because it smells better. We're going to finish with the prettiest smell. If you, if, will it still work if you do it the other way? Probably, but it might smell different, right? So back to her story, we fixed her up, made a spray, must be distilled water, not because it's pure, but because other water is full of stuff, right? Like I said, minerals, fluoride, whatever. So we must use distilled water and just get out your calculator, three to five parts per thousand. And you can do that for any sort of, you could use that formula for douching, for example, for you ladies with a vaginal infection, three to five parts per thousand, you're sort of creating a hydrosol. Or if you've got a hydrosol, like rose water, and watch out for, mm, with rose, I'm kind of skipping away from where I want it to be right now, but um, when a plant is steam distilled, like if I steam distilled parsley, for example, the end result doesn't smell like parsley, it smells like parsley soup, because it is. We cooked it, right? It's parsley soup, man. that's the essential oil, it's parsley soup oil. So another way that we can get out of in the old days before we had stills, when we go back, I don't know how archeologists and, um, any of those old guys. I don't know how they've decided that we were using fragrant aromatic herbs before we had speech. I do remember that there was one dig from ancient Persia, which is now Iraq, and I hope it wasn't destroyed in any of the wars recently, where they found this guy and they called him Shanadar for whatever reason. So this guy's buried holding a bouquet of herbs on his chest and then coming out from his hips, a pile of each of the, I think there was a dozen or so herbs. So the wind didn't do this. Come up with a better idea. I think this guy had to have been a healer of some sort. He was an early herbalist. 
free speech, apparently. And four of those herbs were very aromatic. One of them is a dear friend of ours, a guy named Yara Willard. I studied under Terry years ago when I was what Terry would call a herbal sprout. And his son, is, he calls himself a herbal Jedi now. And a lot of his products are here at the, at the light cellar. And um, again, I'm proud to have been one of his inspirators when he was just a puppy. I have pictures of Yara when he was still in his mama's belly because his mother is one of my very best friends in the world. We're apparently, if you believe in such things, we go back to Atlantis. We've been good friends for that many life. Our, our lifetimes have been going like the double helix thing and we keep crossing paths. So anyway, uh, enough about Yarrow, but uh, high quality product, heart in the right place, that sort of thing. Back to what I was saying about cooking. When you're blending, it better be with a smile on your face. <clears throat> the last thing I would wanna see somebody doing is pouring rose oil while yelling at somebody or in a cranky mood. <laughs> you're just gonna kill it, right? You gotta be full of love when you're doing that. And the thing is, Rose oil makes you want to be in love. It just feels like love. It's like liquid love. Something we started doing at the house when I get rose water in five gallon pails. And what we started doing when we finally used up the pail was you get this little thing to save your wrist. You can crank very easily, uh, pull the lids off five gallon pails. And we would take turns sticking the five gallon pail over your head. <laughs> and and there'd be, there's a little bit left, so it kind of drips down your like if you got a top on as a female, it's gonna run between your breasts and that sort of thing. So you got these little, and when you go inside a five pound pail, you sound exactly like Darth Vader, right? It's a great trick. So we would do this if we finished one and I knew I was having a dinner party in the next couple of days, I would always keep the pail handy and make everybody, it was, it was a treatment we would do at the, at the dinner was pass it around the table and everybody had to take their turn putting this five gallon pail over their head and say, <gasps> like you know, and nice dessert lane, you know, or whatever. But um, uh, it's just nice to know, and I like sharing that distilled water story because you can use almost all essential oils in the eye if you dilute it to that point, three to five percent. Any more than that, and it's going to separate, just like the rosemary that Malcolm showed us in the jug. It's going to dissociate, right? There's rose oil all through that jug, somewhere around 3%. And then it's saturated, right? So back to where I started and got way off track. Hit a chicken on the head, do whatever you want to a chicken, make sure it's dead, get the feathers off and throw it in a pot. And as it cooks, the fat's gonna come out and rise to the surface, right? So that is a, some of it, a saturated fat, which means like butter at room temperature, it's a solid. And we know that too much saturated fat in your diet might lead to an abundance of low density lipoproteins, which are the bad type of cholesterol. We know that HDLs, high density lipoproteins are actually good for you. You need them for some of your hormones, et cetera. So back to where I went way off track. Um, Fatty acids make fatty oils, almond oil, grapeseed oil, olive oil, all of those, right? We use some of them in skincare. But when people started making essential oils, they were distilling it, they felt that they were capturing the spirit or essence of the plant. So they called them essential oils in reference to their spirit. Nothing to do with essential in your diet. So essential fatty acids are essential in your diet. You can't make them. Your body can make calcium out of silica. If you've broken a bone, you wanna be supplementing silica because those bones are gonna heal a lot faster. And you can get it in all sorts of organic forms. Like there's so many ways to define organic. Technically, aircraft fuel is organic. It comes from a recycled forest, right? Our, our whole industry in Alberta of working with hydrocarbons, right? So let's back it up. Another thing that comes up a lot is you must never, ever, ever, I swear, I'm getting my certificate here. I would never, ever, ever use essential oils internally. Not the odd thing. Everything in a candy store has essential oils in it. Every single product. 
That's what I was going to do like half an hour ago. I used to be able to just grab all my props from the room next to my kitchen kind of thing, but now I'm in a care home and I have to get my own products shipped back to me from Kelowna from the woman who bought all of my stuff, right? So I had two different limes and the lime that she sent me is not the one that I wanted. So I had to kind of work on this a little bit. What I'm trying to do is get much less than a drop of cardamom. And the lime I'm used to We'll try that. That was lime. Yeah, we got it. I'll just pass this around. Tell me that's not a roll of wine gums or a roll of trop tropic fruit flavored lifesavers, right? No? So all we need to make that candy is a bunch of fake colors and a whole lot of sugar, you know? And we can make all of that candy out of it, right? But just, just smell it. And when you're done with that, if I usually do it on a bigger cloth, if you have a whiteboard around, you know how you'd use the brush to clean up the whiteboards and yet there's always a bit of film left behind. That's like the best thing in the world to take. I always use the rag to clean the whiteboards because it takes all that ink off just right away. So it's kind of like, I think the George Carlin here, it's a floor wax. No, it's a dessert topping. Wrong again. It's a floor wax and a dessert topping. I was sad when he died last year. Um, well, the way I usually do it with the different lime is about 20 drops of orange, two drops of lime, and one drop of cardamom. But the way I had to turn it around here was that one drop of cardamom, I tried it in my room, was too strong. So that's why I did what I did was I just rubbed my finger to get a little bit on my finger to just get a smudge, just a smidge of it because there's no other way to get half a drop. Well, we're on drops. Every aromatherapy book that I've ever seen says there's 20 drops in a mill. Did anybody ever check? All right. I was already working for one of the biggest distributors in, in North America called Aroma Vera. It started with a Frenchman named Marcel Lavabra who'd come from Provence and had some friends back home with distilleries and away he, yeah, look at him go. So uh, he had this beautiful big company and I ended up doing product launches. So if you had a salon or a health food store and you bought some product, uh, you'd get me to train your staff for an evening. If you bought a big rack full of stuff, you got me for a whole weekend. And um, that's, that's a big part of what started me doing this as I am here with you today. So um, why did I bring that up? Uh, or, uh, yes, thank you. I'm glad somebody, I'm glad somebody's listening. <laughs> um, so there's all these books. And if you actually cite things, which you can do in some books, Way back when, Bob wrote a book and made a mistake. And then Carol quoted him, then Nancy quoted her, and then Bob quoted her, and, and you got all of a sudden there's 20 books on the shelf that all say there's 20 drops in a mill. So of course, everybody knows there's 20 drops in a mill. And I was making blends up for these little first aid kits I used to make. So how come in these four and a half mill bottles, Backing up about this a bit, if you, if you end up making stuff to sell to clients or whatever at some point, don't believe whatever your invoice says in terms of what size the bottle is. These are called 10 mil bottles. If you put 10 mils in them, the oil would be a little below where the label is right now. And it just looks wrong. It looks like somebody used some, like you're getting ripped off or whatever, right? So I was at a place called Richard's Packaging one morning. There's a couple of blondes, not that that matters, behind the counter, but a couple of nice ladies there. And there's a big sale on this month. So there's a pallet full of these big containers. There's 350 or something in a, in a flat and a, and a whole pallet full of them, a big sign saying on sale this month, 10 mil bottles and um, big sign. And I look at the two gals behind the counter and I said, girls, do, do you happen to know what size these are? They looked at each other and looked at me and 
did that twice and thought like, is this guy blind or just stupid or what's his problem here? And I said, well, no, but you have to understand that some of the things that people like me are gonna put in these bottles are worth as much as $4 a drop. So it's important that I know, oh, you sell graduate cylinders. Would you mind if I just use one of those and just put some water in it? So um, we fill the bottle. No, we, we take a graduate cylinder and put it in the bottle. And that's where it comes up to. And I, I said, does that look right to you as a consumer? Looks wrong to me as a consumer, it's way down there. So when I actually filled it to where I wanna see it, which is about there, you know, to where the round part meets the straight part, that's 12 mil. So that's why my labels say 12 mils, because that's what's in here is 12 mils. And a lot of people never check. So they're selling 12 mils of product, you know, for a 10 mil, like they're losing money almost with every bottle you sell because they never check. So one morning, back to Aroma Vera, I kind of had, I was a bit anxious by all of this. And I thought, well, what's Aroma Vera doing? So I got out a graduate cylinder and a 15 mil bottle of lavender. The first thing I did is dump the whole thing into the graduate cylinder. Oh, they're kind. I actually have 15 mils. It says 15 mils. I got 15 mils. Isn't that nice? I got what I paid for. Okay. Let's see how many drops are in there. It's a Saturday morning. I got nothing coming up in a hurry. So I put all the oil back in the bottle. Six hundred and thirty-seven. So the very company who's selling me these oils has all of this stuff in their manuals and books that they give out with the product and so forth, saying there's twenty drops in a mill. So all sorts of therapists, like physiotherapists and massage therapists, are buying their product, and following little recipes, and saying this is a. Well, I don't have a larger, but this is. They're just taking a, a larger bottle now and making a a 5% blend, and, and that's because the book says don't use anything stronger than 5% for this particular recipe. And they're using 2.5%, maybe. And when I got on the scene, I had a lot of therapists coming up to me and saying, Blaine, how come your oils work so much better than the other stuff we've tried? I said, well, part of it might be that we're all happy when we make the stuff, and part of it might be that my 5% blends are actually 5% blend. And I've had people that are making blends look at me and say, oh, do you, do, do you, does the 5% mean by volume? What else could it possibly mean? You're putting stuff in a bottle. It says 5%, it should be 5%. And because you got your drops all wrong, you don't even have 3% in there. Mine were 5% blends, so they worked better. No magician, I checked. All these people never checked, including the company I was working for, selling coast to coast in both Canada and the United States. They never checked. Look at all this fancy printed books and pamphlets they sell and give away. Nobody checked. So I say this to you as I have a thousand times by now, if you're ever anywhere in North America and find a dropper top that puts out 20 drops per mil, Call me immediately, collect, I'll take the call, and I'll charter a helicopter to get there as fast as I can. Right? It's never going to happen. So for the dropper tops that I'm using and everybody else that I know in the business, lots of friends of mine, you'd think they'd be competitors, but we're all friends. There's about 40 drops in a mill. Another part of the problem is the viscosity of the oil. Trying to count, like just doing what I did with the lime, it was hard for me to count 20 drops of lime because it's gonna be like five, six, six, seven, eight, 20. You know, like lime and lemon and some of them are real thin. So the stuff's like pouring a big glass of water into a small plant or something, the stuff pours out. Where other things, I'm not gonna do this because I don't wanna make a mess of something, but vetiver is an oil that's real thick. It comes, it's the rosiny oil. It comes from a plant root. It's a grass root that we get from South America and India, I think. And it's real thick. So you get a recipe that calls for 10 drops of vetiver. Well, today you might just say, Siri, call Carol, would you? Oh, hi, Carol. Yeah, it's Blaine. I, I just, um, 
<laughs> just working on a blend here and I wanted to, hang on, one. And I just, um, I was wondering if, would you mind sharing, you know, we, we both really love that no cheese cheesecake that we had for dessert, just a second, uh, two. Like you could probably wash your car in the time it takes to get 10 drops of vetiver because it's so thick. So it's coming through that little dropper and it kind of goes, oh, I don't want to leave the bottle. I like it in the bottle. With my... I want to stay with my friends. <laughs> and it finally comes out with this big fat drop that goes into the, the mixing bottle where, where lemon is like, well, this is 16, 20. So viscosity has something to do with it too. But on average, I'm going to say there's 40 drops in a mill, at least with those dropper tops, right? Who came up with that 20 drops in a mill thing? But virtually every aromatherapy book says that's the deal. And back to you can't take essential oils internally. At the right, at the right dose, yes, you can. Less than 5% of the oils that are made in the world today are used in anything associated with aromatherapy. 95% of them are used in food flavoring and cleaning products, both for household and domestic use. In the old days, when my mother was young, there's a maybe a rosewood coffee table here, like Karate Kid, wax on, wax off, paste wax. Lots of rubbing, rub on the wax, get a new cloth, rub off the wax, like, wax on, wax off. <laughs> Go child. So um, the nice people at Johnson's and Johnson's said, I pledge to all you housewives out there that I'm going to make this easier for you. So they dissolve some paste wax in a whole bunch of lemon oil. Wait a few minutes. That's good. And wipe it off. Wax on, wax off. So they're using a little bit of essential oil. Sorry, a lot of essential oil with just a little bit of wax. So we have this continuum where there's lower viscosity oils and things start getting a little thicker. You start getting to things that eventually weigh down that chain when, when the carbon molecules are this big. We get into something I stopped at earlier with the terpenes, monoterpenes, 10 carbons, sesquiterpenes, 15 carbons, diterpenes are all getting, already getting too heavy to fly. As soon as you get to diterpenes and into triterpenes, we're talking hormones. There's lots of plants and mushrooms that have triterpenes in them, but you're not going to find them in essential oil because they can't fly with the steam. They're too heavy. I got it from one of the French doctors who's Jean Valnet. I had lunch with him, no, supper one day with him. I said, Jean, is it uh, is it because discleriol in the clary sage, it can go even though it's too heavy, it's just the shape of the molecule? Like, you, you know, box kite? <laughs> you know, it's like, box kite shouldn't fly, right? You look at a box, you think, that's not going to fly. It's a box, but they fly, right? So something about discleriol, which is an alcohol, oh, I parted there. When you take a sesquiterpene, and add one atom of oxygen to it, you just made alcohol. That's what alcohol is. An oxygen holding hands with a hydrogen is called a hydroxyl. So you just made alcohol. Another way that carbons hold hands is six of them will hold hands in a circle. And that's called an aromatic ring, even though it has no smell. It's also known, mostly known as the benzene ring. So if you take one hydroxyl, and put it into a benzene ring, you just made phenols. Phenols are what I call the big guns. That's what's in stuff like red thyme and oregano. People I talk to from countries like Australia and Europe think that people in North America are absolutely stupid that they would actually take oregano every day to get through the winter without catching a cold or a flu. Same thing. Um, they just think we're crazy. That's like hunting partridge with a rocket propelled grenade. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a guide with me carrying the equipment. I see one on the hill there now, sir. <laughs> There's a nine foot hole in the earth and some feathery is coming up. I think, I, think you, I think you got him, sir. 
So if you use something like oregano all the time like that, it's like the boy who cried wolf. What are you gonna do when you've got something that's already become just like penicillin? We've developed tea tree resistant bacteria now because we've overused it. We're making the mistakes again. Another thing I like to bring up, even though it's not something I was gonna talk about today, but I don't care if you're a standard practice doctor, a GP or a specialist or any sort of natural healer, if you see a problem, a condition with somebody, if you're too quick to jump to that that's their problem, you, you may be making a grave error because very often what you see as a condition is actually a symptom of a bigger problem. So very often skin problems are actually lung problems, which might be bowel problems. <laughs> and you have to get to the heart of it, right? So how many times do I see very young children on ventilators, you know, because they have asthma. And it's really because their mothers actually believe the only good way to get calcium for your growing baby is, is calcium, pasteurized dairy product. You get a lot more usable calcium out of some broccoli. They don't like the taste of it. Make a smoothie out of it, do something to it. But we get most of our actual calcium that you can use. It's like, what good is a $200,000 paycheck if you have to pay $180,000 in taxes? How about a paycheck that big and $20,000 worth of taxes? Then you're rich, right? So we need things that are, your body wants to keep the right balance between phosphorus and calcium. Now I'm doing a nutrition class, oh well. Um, and it, it wants this particular balance there. And if you take things that are high in calcium, but no phosphorus, you're actually sucking phosphorus out of your bones to make that match. Whole grains and the whole mustard family, brassica, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, all that group are where we get usable calcium. The Dairy Nutrition Council, I have an old friend that used to work there and if I was calling her at work and she'd answer the phone, Dairy Nutrition Council, Jill speaking, I'd start laughing. <laughs> I'd say, Jill, you can't use those three words together. What? Dairy Nutrition Council. It's like picking up the phone saying, military intelligence office. Like, <laughs> they just don't belong together, right? Crazy, the things that we do. Anyway, um, enough about that event. So um, our oils are all medicinal grade. Sorry, true story. Two families out to uh, somebody's big home in the country and a big blizzard's happened. It's Christmas week, big blizzard. And a little girl has acute bronchitis, probably pneumonia. Um, doesn't really matter which pneumonia is just another different version of staphylococcus. Um, and uh, we got nothing. I don't have my kit with me. And the roads need to be plowed before anybody's going anywhere. And we've got this 11-year-old girl with, she's just, she's really sick. And she's spiking a fever already, so to do, to do. Is, is there a place in the barn? I think I can, whoa, Blaine, you might not even find your way back from the barn. How about tie me onto a rope? I'm gonna get out to the barn. You got a box, a little cabinet out there somewhere where all the paint stuff goes. Do you think you might have some turpentine? Why? She's sick, I gotta help. So through the snow, I go to, to bring back, I find some turpentine there. What's turpentine? Essential oil of pine boughs. Kind of fun to know. That's why it's so cheap, right? What, what do we use it for typically? Cleaning paintbrushes. Why? Because it's a really good solvent. So why do I want it? Because this little girl's lungs are so full of mucus, she can't breathe. And what we want to do is breathe in a solvent that's gentle enough so that the solvent starts, the mucus starts melting, sliding. And as soon as it starts sliding, nerves pick up on that and go, no, we don't want that. So <laughs> you start coughing right away to blow all of that stagnant, you, you never want to be mucus free. You couldn't swallow, you couldn't digest your supper tonight. You definitely would never have sex again. Like there, there's all these things that we need mucus for. It's part of our cleansing design. So inside your lungs, oh, inside your lungs, there's all of these little cells 
They're ciliated, which means coated in hairs. And they kind of work with every breath you take. It's kind of like a big carpet. Oh, here we go. So this is inside a bronchial. And it's kind of a, a big landscape. It's not a close up, but all of these little cells are built with all these little hairs. And with each breath you take, those little hairs, especially with a little bit of mucus on them, grab stuff like pollen, dust. What's the biggest thing causing dust in your home? Your own dead skin. Isn't that just creepy? You know, if you've never done it before, uh, put a brand new bag with, with a get some black cloth somewhere, an old t-shirt or something and put it into the bag so that you can vacuum with a power nozzle, vacuum your bed mattress and you'll, you'll almost puke because from a small area bed mattress, you end up with half a cup of, of this inner skin, inner arm skin, that's your own dead skin. And in that skin, that dead skin, gosh, look at me go with things like those. There's, there's things like this. This particular fella is in somebody's eyebrows. It's a nice place, nice place to hide is inside somebody's eyes, eyebrows. Now, here's one for you. By cell count, not by weight, by cell count, the little creatures living in and on your body outnumber you. <laughs> That's creepy. By cell count, your pets outnumber you. Each of us is a walking zoo. All right, so you have to get used to that idea. And not all of them are unfriendly. Some of them we really want. So, uh, so out to the barn we go, we get the turpentine. On another day, I was reading a book or something and the phone rings and it was somebody that got my name from somebody at a health food store, probably a former student student and she had a recipe her little girl had an ear infection a acute ear infection and um she had a recipe in an aromatherapy book that called for so much of this and so much of this and about five ingredients and one of them was terabentine and she'd called about five stores and she couldn't find any terabentine and i kind of giggled and i said do you have a, maybe a cabinet down in the basement somewhere where you keep all your paint and stuff that leftovers paint brushes and things she said well how did you know? I said, well, I'm just guessing. And she said, well, yeah. And I said, are you on a cordless phone? She said, yeah. And I said, would you, would you mind going down to the basement to your, your paint cupboard there? And just look around. I want to see if you have any turpentine. And, and she said, oh, yes, there's some here. And I said, okay, turn the bottle around. Be before I said that, I said, is the book you're reading, does it happen to be a French author? And, and she said, yeah, it's Jean Falnay. He's a medical doctor. I said, yes, I've met him <laughs> in San Francisco at a conference. We shared the stage that day. Um, and, and so uh, she found it just outstanding that I would actually know the author of the book she was using. But terabentine is just French for turpentine. So when I had her turn the bottle around and she said, it's terabentine. She said, oh, no, but this is for paint brushes. And I said, for the number of drops you're using and the dilution that you're using, it'll work just fine. I'd rather use some, some pine oil that's done with better grade. The whole thing's a little better, more like something you would hopefully get at a health food store instead of Home Depot. But for what she was doing today, that was just, I said, use it for your blend, make your blend, treat your daughter. That's going to be just fine. And she was in disbelief when she hung up the phone. You know that. So um, back to the barn and the, and the blizzard. So we got this little girl with acute bronchitis. She's hacking her lungs out. And um, back to that picture that we had going around. Did that one go around? Yeah. So what happens is, in the case of this, the owner of this picture, you see all this stuff here that just looks like barbecue. Can you see this back there? It looks like barbecue briquettes. Well, that's where from toxic stuff in your air, the ciliated cells have died. Another thing that happens at times is for the smoker's cough, imagine that you have this nice little lightweight mucus coating that slowly migrates along with pollen and dust 
and it's still three to five centimeters an hour, that stuff is sliding out of your lungs, back up to your throat, and without even thinking about it, you go, <clears throat> how many times a day do you do that? <clears throat> and you swallow it, unless you're a hockey player and you spit it out on the ice, but you, <clears throat> you clear your throat, and it's okay because stomach acids will protect you from any bacteria or even viruses that are, that are in that stuff in your throat. But when it gets so thick and it stops moving, Kevin Costner, a uh, bunch of baseball players coming into his cornfield. What was the, what was the underlying? Build it and they will come. So why does, there's a cold going around. No, it's a curse. It's a spell. No, it's a cold. It's going around the office. How come half the employees get it and the other half don't? Because half of them, their lungs are still full of mucus. Bacteria and viruses just love warm, sticky, dark places. So they get into those lungs and they just start reproducing like crazy. And you're full of this morbid mess. If you start doing what I'm talking about, you're like just taking some turpentine and breathing it. You cough up chunks of brown and green stuff that's just disgusting. Healthy mucus should be crystal clear. If it's white or got white streaks in it, you're fighting an infection. But if it's green and brown stuff, like you really got a clean house. So I might have not no, forgotten all about this, but I'm going to pass around. I wanted to have some eucalyptus radiata, but I don't. So I'm going to pass around the blend. Now, remember that Oh, no, not that one. Oh, here. This one. Not quite a super glue ad. But because this bottle's been around for a while, the solvent effect of this oil just going through the dropper top is, is melting the plastic. But what I wanna do, and I want you to all try this, get a couple of drops, one is enough. When you do this, don't cover your whole face because if you start coughing, you, you might have stuff in your throat that's gonna end up in your eye sockets. So cover your nose and mouth. Breathe in real deep through your nose and exhale through your mouth. That's going to warm up the oils even more so that they're even more volatile now. And just keep doing that with your eyes closed for about a minute. And when you're done, you're just going to feel a little more awake and a little bit elated because you're immediately getting better oxygen delivered to your cells, which are delivering oxygen to every cell of your body, which next to water is the single most important thing you need to survive. Now, stepping it up a little bit. So if you feel the need to cough when you do this, cough. You're supposed to. But now I'm going to take one of the eucalyptuses. So there's one called radiata. And there's another one called smithy eye. In Latin names, if you see a double I, it's pronounced E-I. And Latin properly pronounced has no soft sounds. So that we say echinacea, that's slang it should really be pronounced echinacea. There's no soft sounds in real Latin. And why do we use Latin anyway? Because it's a dead language. Nobody in the world speaks Latin anymore. Priests write it, they probably use it a bit you know, in, in Rome, but um, it's a dead language. And English is so hard for people from other countries to learn because so many words here have double meanings. Think about the word down. D-O-W-N, it's a four letter word, down. Is that four or five? D-O-W-N. Um, so down, how do we explain to somebody who's totally Spanish, they're learning English for the first time, that you can, hey everybody, let's get down. I like this song. Or, the ceiling's falling. Or, I'm, I'm feeling a little down today. Or, hey, what about my new down vest? That word has so many meanings in our language, it's silly. So we use Latin because there's no double meanings. It's a dead language. The word arvensis means of the field. If there's two, so Latin names are always like family name first, first name second. So my name in Latin would be Andrusecius Blanius. And then we might use a third word or 
if I was, if all, all of my siblings, let's say I came from nine kids like my parents did, if all of the rest of the family had long thin leaves and one of the girls for some reason had big triangular shaped leaves, they would call her Andrusecius triangularis because her outstanding feature is triangular shaped leaves, right? So you just kind of get used to the Latin. And sometimes it'll go into a third world word where things have been uh, hybridized. And sometimes the, the plant person um, that, that did the hybridization would put their own name on it. So you might get, I'm gonna talk about lavender. A minute. How are we doing for time? Two minutes. Two minutes? Oh gosh. Wow. Um, <laughs> Get this guy started. Uh, and I, I got some, I've covered two words, two words on this page. That's how far I got. <laughs> Thinking of the stuff I might share with you today. I had no idea how big the room would be, how fast I would go through all of this stuff. Are you just, you're following me around now with that thing? Yeah. I'm making you work. I, um, I used to love, there was a classroom that I taught at the Medicine Hat College where I would get the second year massage therapy students for a week to teach them about essential oils. And in a room about this size, the whole wall was whiteboards. So by the end of my first day there, I would have used every square foot of whiteboard. And <laughs> my students would go home with a sore neck, you know, but I would leave a lot of these things hanging because I might come back to them later in the week. So it would be like graffiti on the wall. But then, you know, and, then I don't get swollen calves from standing still all day. I, I love cordless mics. I bought my own for $680 so that if I'm going to a conference somewhere and I'm saying, I got a cordless mic for me? No, oh, I'll just go to the, I got, I got my own, yeah. So I spent $680 on a cord, cordless Sure mic so I could just plug in to other people's PA systems because I hate standing still. Standing still all day is hard on your calves, right? You've got a job like a bank teller or something you go home with swollen calves because all of the fluid is going down. Your heart is beating and pushing blood through your pipes against gravity. Blood goes all the way down to your toes and has to come all the way back up to your heart, but it's got a pump there. But your lymphatic system, which is sort of like your back alleys, has no heart. It's like the tin there. So against gravity, all this fluid's going downhill. And the only way to get it back up, there's little valves there so that if you didn't have those valves and you did a headstand, your head would get this big within a minute and a half and explode. Right? So you got all these little valves to keep them just slow moving. So with every breath, once it gets up into the big pipes towards the heart again, finally with a deep breath, which by the way is your only off button, that'll, you know, somebody's hysterical. Where did that word come from? Well, only women get hysterical, uh, right? And, you know, it's all that to you. So Marty, Marty, just, just, take a deep, just take a deep breath, honey. Heard that ever? When you take a deep breath and hold it in, it's the only off button you have for your whole freak out system. And I insist having taught wilderness first aid, for example, if you're gonna walk into an accident scene or help somebody that's, let's go big time, a severed leg, or you got a major artery that's been last and there's blood spurting two feet out of an arm or something like that. You have to, before you enter the scene, if there's nobody better there and you have any training, get involved. I'm trained to use an AED. I'm no hero. I'm not gonna run in as soon as I see somebody fall over and it looks like men. I'm not gonna go get the AED and go in there, get, get ready to use it unless there's nobody better than me there. Then I will, cause I'm the only one there that's trained. See what I mean? So, um, sidebar on a sidebar. So whenever you are going to enter, this even works on dogs. I've always had dogs until recent. Dog park just right at the end of my block. And sometimes there's a couple of dogs that start a fight and there's a circle of people around the dogs right away yelling at them. They're already full of anger. And you start yelling at them and their ears are a lot more sensitive than yours. You're yelling at them, which just makes them more aggressive. So at times I walk right up as close as I dare and just sit on the grass with my arms out, palms up and go, Psst. they might actually stop. And I'm like, what do you do? And they might just stop and look at each other and go, 
yeah, we were just playing ball, weren't we? Like, it, you know, so immaculate calm is one of the best first aid devices you can bring into a trauma scene. Deep breath, maybe two, and then just go, hi, my name's Carol. I just watched you get smashed off a bus window. You might taste some blood in a minute, stripping down your face because you bounced at high speed right off your forehead and rolled to a stop against this tree. I'm not gonna touch you because you might have spinal injuries. I'm just gonna stick a business card in your pocket because if you need help with a lawsuit later, I'm just gonna give you this business card. And hear those sirens, what is your name? Sorry? Roxanne. So I'm just Roxanne, I'm a little concerned. Hear those sirens coming, Roxanne? They're, they're for you. That's the EMS vehicles coming, they're for you. And I'm just gonna sit here with you for a minute. I'm just curious, Roxanne, can you, can you wiggle your, can you make your, can you just play with your feet like this? You can, can your feet come out in front? Oh God, that's great, Roxanne. I'm just so, can you wiggle your toes for me? Are you wearing sandals? Really? Can you wiggle your toes right? And I see them. I was a little worried from the force of that shock that you might have spinal, spinal injury, but you're gonna be just fine. They're getting closer. I'm just gonna sit with you here to keep you awake and maintain consciousness until the EMS guys get there. I'm not gonna to touch her, even though I'm, in my mind, I'm pretty certain she has no spinal injuries, but you see what I mean? Keep them awake, keep them calm. Sometimes the worst, the worst injury when you walk into a trauma scene, like a school bus got knocked over by a gravel truck and there's bleeding people and screaming and crying all over the place. But just over there is one of the teachers that was with the group and the way the bus tipped over, a pane of glass shattered and actually severed a little girl's head right off. And it rolled about 10 feet across the pavement until it hit her foot. She's going into acute shock. There's a guy over there that's spurting blood like crazy. I noticed you have a belt and I did, you know how to do a tourniquet with belts? Take your belt off and go put it on around. Go do that right now. And, and I'm going to that woman over there because she may be in the greatest danger here. There's people here, it is called triaging. There's people here I can't help with what I've got here for equipment and my, my knowledge and training. I can help some of these people, but she's going into traumatic shock and I need to go bring her out of it. Hi. How are you feeling? But you have to come into it with that angelic calm. You can just rock the world. So I have to pass. I got just enough time, I hope, to pass a couple of other things around. Because the second one I want to pass around is a different. Sorry, you're way over there by yourself in the window. And you blend in with all of the stuff in the window. I keep forgetting you're there. Well, just for that, I'm going to bring you this first. Did you get to sniff the last one? Did you smell the last one? I did. Okay. So this time, nobody in the room coughs. I'm proud of you. Everybody here has pretty healthy lungs right now. This one's a little stronger. So this one might make you cough. Because it's got ketones in it. Now, some ketones, like acetone that you might use fixing a Corvette fender or building a canoe or something like that, is very toxic stuff. I was outraged. One of the brain tests they had to do at the hospital, uh, the one where they glue all the little electrodes to your head and so forth. And I could smell the fumes when I was halfway up the hall going to that part of the clinic. Uh, I wonder what they're using there because I smell a lot of ketones. And when I came into the, um, the room where they were gonna start gluing stuff to my head and I picked up the can was right there and I picked up the can right on the can, it says you should be using this only in an extremely ventilated area with this particular number of a double canister face mask. And these two women are working with this crap all day in a not ventilated room with no face mask on. I'm not talking about the little blue ones we were wearing. For, I'm talking one of those things like a car that, guy that paints cars uses, right? And it even gave you the number of the one to be using. And solvents like that cause MS. There's enough paperwork to go from here to the window that's been published, not from a bunch of hippie herbalists, but by, in medical journals, all over the world that those types of solvents over time, we just aren't designed to be protected. 
And those solvents cross your blood brain barrier and do all sorts of nerve damage. The people that make these three ring minders, they should be wearing hazmat suits. And in the right company, they do. The guys in the back do. But the girls in the front office, they're in skirts and pantyhose and blouses. And the only thing separating them is a T-bar ceiling and just a normal door like that. There should be positive airflow things so that they're protected from that. Girl works there for eight years and wonders why she's got MS. There's so much goofy stuff we do in our, and to test my brain, they're gonna glue stuff onto my head. That's some of the most toxic stuff you can put near me. And, and they leave a lot of residue. So you're reading a book later too close to a, a lamp and it's melting off my scalp and down into my ears. And it's, it's just goofy. Some of the stuff that we do in a hospital today, you know, a lot of it is great news. A lot of it isn't. Now, the last one, what if you, because this has happened to me. Oh, I did bring um, Massage therapy studio just a block from my house. And uh, ladies, one of the girls working there has taken classes with me. And she's got a really, really sick woman there for massage. And she's just hacking away and so forth. And uh, um, I'm passing things around. And... Um, or somebody else might come in that's referred, re referred, good. There you go, cop. When, when it comes around, somebody might, as soon as they see all these, don't be getting me any of that Vic stuff. You know, well, what did your mother used to stick Vicks up your nose with a spoon or something? Yeah, bitch, do you know my mom? You know, and I, I said, okay, let's try something a little different here. This is for the person that hates Vic smells. And guess what? There's stuff like black spruce, which is kind of like turpentine, and there's still tea tree in here, and eucalyptus, but you can't smell it because it's camouflage with basil. So do it again. And with this last one coming around, you're going to feel, as you deep breathe it like that, you're going to feel just a gentle warmth. This gentle warmth go all the way deep in your lungs. Because it's got clove oil in it, which is a very, that's another one of the big guns, as I call them. Right? So we've got phenols come in red thyme and oregano. That's one set of big guns. And there's another group called phenylpropanes, and that's where things like clove oil come in. So we all know that clove oil has been used forever in uh, dentistry or for toothaches and things. When I was a little boy, if I had a toothache, they'd go get a toothpick. And I can remember my father saying, Dora, don't get any on his lips. So even back then, my father knew that you don't want clove oil on your lips. So if you were to take some on your gums and you slipped and got it on your lips and it starts burning, what are you going to do? It's the one you've been here all day. Get some oil on it and rub your lips down with any cooking, right? Just dilute it that way. So essential oils, there's very few of them that should ever be used neat. Just like ordering scotch at a bar, neat means full strength straight up. There's very few essential oils that should ever be used full strength on the skin. And the broader the area of your body, the lower the dosage should be. So you, if you're gonna do a whole back rub, we mainly get 1%. You know, because you've got a whole lot of skin there and some of it's getting into your bloodstream. So the, the bigger the area that you're covering, the lower the dosage should be in terms of percentage. Is that clear enough to kind of get in that? So did everybody get the candy smell? Did that go all okay? I usually do it just a little better. But uh, yeah, no, that's fine. You can keep it if you want. Yeah, just stick it in your car and your car will smell nice for a week. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right, we're done. Yeah, okay. I know you, you could do this forever. Uh, I could keep these people here till midnight if they wanted to. Stay here. <laughs> let's let's order some Chinese food and just stay here. And... Yeah, there we are. Okay, well, if you want to hear more Blaine, uh, him and I have been doing weekly series of uh, he just gets to share share his wisdom, tell stories. Uh, we got it on YouTube. We're starting to put it on audio as well. So it's on podcasts. And, if you haven't uh, noticed, I like to talk. Oh yeah, yeah. That's I have stories great. to tell. Yeah. And uh, what do you think? Should we have him back for another live event? Yeah. Again? Uh, 
All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for everybody that tuned in online as well. That's great. Uh, if you'd like a re replay of the recording uh, and you didn't register, that's the easiest way for me to, way to do it. So through the open house, just register and then I'll send you the replay plus uh, another presentation that Simon had done previously. But otherwise, thanks for being here. You're welcome to kind of hang out, ask more questions. Uh, Blaine, I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. So no. we'll, we'll hang out and uh, yeah, be recycled. Yeah, you get rid of that. Yeah, you don't want to keep this as a prop for another time. No, I have some, you know, in my room, I can't get weights to do anything with. So I've, I've taped two of these together. So uh, right. the liter size weighs exactly one kilo. So with two taped together, I almost have a five pound hand weight. And so a little bit of duct tape and some Listerine bottles, and that's the best I can do in my room. Okay, so I'm I'm here to answer anything. So we did have a question, and maybe you can answer that while we cut the recording. Okay. Uh, what about snake bites? So she had seen your blend called anti venom. And she was wondering about is that could you apply that would that work for snake bites um in some cases yes uh the old story that you see in western movies about cutting a cross-shaped thing and sucking the poison right bad idea <laughs> okay. all you're gonna do is yeah that's a really bad idea yeah uh generally speaking you want to be as still as you can right so just keep me keep your back up yeah so that you're lowering your, your heart rate yeah. And hopefully you have somebody to help you. Um, oils wise, I wasn't thinking about snakes when I made anti-venom. I, I think so. I yeah. was thinking about spiders. Right. Yeah. But um, uh, I would give it a go. Um, I wouldn't want to stake my own life or my, re my re reputation on that working on a rattlesnake bite, for example. I honestly don't know. Yeah. yeah. So if you get bitten by a rattlesnake, try it. And let me know. Send me a postcard. <laughs> Anti-venom is a blend for, I made it for, yeah, that I made for uh, spiders, right? It's, it's sort of funny that um, it's another thing I could have got to with um, using the term spiritually loosely, I suppose. There's a tree in New South Wales, Australia and elsewhere called funnel web spiders. And um, yeah, so they build these, mama is a big spider that sits at the back of the web and all she really wants to do is eat. And she's got this tiny little husband that runs around and big, builds this big net to keep her well fed. So if he gets a big moth or a small bird in there tonight, it'll flutter around and do a whole bunch of damage. So she's covered for breakfast and lunch tomorrow, but he better get, so anyway, so he has a very, very potent venom right? So that he can get rid of anything that flew into the web. Now, in the old days, the only known antidote, which the aboriginals all knew, was to use the crushed up bark or leaves of the very tree. And that's why I'm saying, if, if, if you become sensitive enough spiritually to ask for help, ask for guidance, help. And in this occasion, Wait a minute. You want me to stand here and crush the bark off this tree? The one with the spiders in it? Are you crazy? You're a bad god. What kind of sense of humor is that? You know, but I mean, that's what it works. So I have a theory that everywhere in the world where there's a threat, there's usually a solution within 10 feet. Like, Stinging nettles, for example, is, is a poor example because they're their own antidote. They're, they're, stinging nettles don't usually last that long, but if you ever get a real big rash coming from some stinging nettles, just make a cup of tea and put a face cloth in it and rub your leg down with, with a tea made from stinging nettles. But, um, and they're very edible and exceedingly nutritious, so it's a great herb. But anyway, um, something like uh, poison ivy, different story, volatile oils are the culprit. And it's not easy to see. It's got shiny little leaves that are sort of Broad lanceolate shape, that might not mean anything to you, but, but they're just low on the ground and you might even pull your pants down to have a pee or something and squat in a bunch of poison ivy, right? So there's a plant that, it's a shrub that gets, is it a shrub? Shrub means the stems don't die off, die in the winter. I think it's a herb. 
doesn't matter. It, let's just go, it's a shrub. Plants about this tall, maybe this wide, and it has either canary yellow flowers, irregular flowers, a little bit like an orchid sort of look, or the other one's a mottled, funny little mottled orange color. Um, and uh, it's one of the properly pronounced impatience, but we would say impatience, if you saw it, it's an impatience plant. And the crushed up leaves of that plant are 100% antidote to poison ivy. So if I'm out on a hike and I see a bunch of those around, I'm on a full lookout for the poison ivy because they're usually neighbors, you see? So sometimes the more you get to know about plants, even things like, uh, well, there's one of the vetches. Much of the pea family has edible roots, but a lot of things that look like a pea because they are have poisonous seeds. And if you saw that movie Into the Wilds, when I, when I saw that film, I was really annoyed with myself because I, that should have been my movie. 50 years ago, right now, exactly 50 years ago, I got dropped off in four and a half feet of snow at minus 27. I left there with a bit of gear and a canoe. And I lived there for four and a half months with my bow and arrow and all of that. Okay, so maybe I'd be a good thing. I'd do a good job on, on that alone show that's on, I don't know. But anyway, um, that's where all of this started. I never wanted to be a herbalist. I never wanted to do anything, but I, I started spending more and more time in the wilderness. And I wanted, first aid by definition is what to do till the doctor comes. I wanted to learn second aid. So I started reading medical journals and things like that. So I knew how to take better care of myself. If I had to reset my own shoulder, and like doing a high brace in a kayak and a big wave, you can just, just stuff like that happens, right? Or a severed limb because you slipped with an ax because you were hurrying. Best advice anybody gave me when I told them I was going to do this trip. I was running away from the world, really. I was a young man. I didn't understand working for a living. Go in the bush for a while at minus 27 and have to hunt for a living. You understand working for a living right away. It's okay. I can stay in bed and freeze to death in the dark or get up and go hunting and fetch some water and, and or make some snow, melt some snow. Like work, live, work, live, work, live. After four months, I, oh, working for a living. I think I got it now. I can come back to the city. So right away, I thought I have to learn more. And I was a whisper away. I was a whisper away from going back to school. And it would have been med school. I was, I was that committed. And that's when a dear friend that I mentioned earlier, Dorothy, had just gotten hooked up with one of her roommates. And that was Terry Willard. And, and she said, you got to come and meet this guy because I think I'm going to marry him. So you got to get over to supper sometime soon. And uh, I had questions for him, from him, for him. And it's like his answers were painted in the sky or something. And I chose to follow the herbal path instead. But maybe just because I'm a Libra, 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 it's always been my mission to convince standard practice people that we aren't all crazy and some of us actually have a lot of knowledge and I've needed an EMS vehicle. They've got stuff I don't have, but I've got stuff they don't have. Also, let's work together. You know, like if you get smacked, maybe you did just fall into a door. Maybe you walked into a door last night or maybe somebody did beat you, whatever, but you got, you're going to have a big bruise on your face. Um, there's a herd called Arnica. We've got nine species that grow in Alberta in the mountains and foothills. And if you use Arnica fast enough after an insult injury like a smash, there's never any bruising whatsoever. It somehow circumvents the bruising. If you've already got a big bruise, it'll help heal it a little faster, but the best time to use it is right after the insult, right? So, um, First wife had uh, TMJ, knew about it for a lot of years growing up as a child and uh, kind of put it off for a long time, but finally realized some of this for now might be covered by my Medicare, the medical provincial healthcare, and a lot of it won't be, and maybe soon none of it will be. So let's, um, let's get it done. So we, it came down to an orthodontist who wanted to daunt because he's trained to daunt, he's an orthodontist and an orthodontist surgeon who wanted to surge because he's a surgeon. So they, you know, can we get these two guys to work together? So we finally got them working as a team. Now, um, just a week or two post-op, I drove Layla to the orthodontist first and some of the staff knew who I was and they were walking around her like flies on poop, staring at her face from every angle because there was absolutely like almost no swelling and no sign of bruising whatsoever, none, zero, zip. And the orthodontist came up to me and he said, 
sorry, but you, you teach this stuff I'm hearing the girls talk? Is it like, is it, I've been doing what I do for 28 years and I, I've never seen this. It, like, I don't know what you're doing, but I want to, I want to know. And I'm pretty busy, but if I could send one of my best girls, would that be, yeah, absolutely. Come on down. Where the ortho, the oral surgeon, if either of us started talking about herbs or essential oils or anything, his way of dealing with us was to leave the room. He wouldn't he just, you know, like that. So, so I was watching through a half open door. He kept looking at his watch and the file and her face and inside from every angle. Flat, you know, and uh, looking at the watch again, I saw him repeat that motion like nine times. And he kept looking at his watch to get the date and looking at the file again. And, and his final thing to say to us was, well, you're still gonna have a lot of bruising probably tomorrow. Like rather than accept that we had another way of dealing with things where the orthodontist was all over it. Wow, you're doing something I don't know about, right? And you know, at my age, if you can, I'm wearing sandals, but if you can teach me a better way to tie my shoes, that'll make my day, if not my week. I love learning new stuff, you know, but some people are just so close-minded. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. They're very, my sister works in the Yeah, but you don't they're have to. Very opposite. Yes. So she, yeah, it's hard for them to wrap their heads around. Yeah, it wasn't in the books that I did. Yeah. I'm eager to interrupt you. Just a minute. From the spiritual world, I want to 